In the early part of the 14th century, there was a deadly outbreak of the bubonic plague in Asia and most of Europe. In fact, between the years of 1347 and 1352, 25 million people died from that plague in Europe alone. Mm -hmm. It was fully one-third of Europe's population. It was once said that the disease spread so rapidly that you could have lunch with your friends, but dinner with your ancestors in paradise. You know, when you think of the deadly effects of that terrible plague, and then you realize that in Revelation, John speaks of seven plagues must, that must befall earth prior to the return of Jesus. It's no wonder that people's hearts fail them for fear when they read Revelation or when they think of the second coming or of the end of time. Today, we're talking about plagues, fear, and a source of hope. Welcome to Faith for Today. No membership test, no lines of birth or race or accomplishment, a church for people who have made errors. That's what this church is here for. You want a church that's made for sinners, just a whole lot like you, this is the place. So we're talking about the seven last plagues. But what are those plagues, and how do they affect us? And do they tell us anything about the character of God? We're going to be asking these questions today as we study from Revelation 15 through 18. But let's begin that study by joining the Arlington Seventh-day Adventist Church for praise and worship.
The Christian community presents the Bible as a book of good news. It's supposed to be the book that tells us the way to salvation. It's supposed to paint a picture of a loving and caring God. And yet this same book tells of seven plagues, deadly plagues, that will hit the whole earth. And they're supposed to become a reality at the end of time. Seven deadly plagues. Is it possible to find good news even in that? That is something that creates a lot of fear in many people's minds. You know, many believe that the seven last plagues are God getting so angry at the wicked and horrible things happen. You know, when it comes to uh, last day events and particularly the, the, the seven last plagues and whatnot, that whole process of going through that time of trouble and difficulty used to really frighten me. Uh, you know, it was like I looked forward to the second coming because, you know, Jesus is going to come, we get to go to heaven and all that. But the thought of having to go through this, this time of trouble and these seven last plagues uh, literally terrified me. And then I did a little more study. And I discovered that these seven last plagues are not just God getting angry with anybody. They're not just God fed up and, and letting it rip. But in fact, the seven last plagues are saving acts of God. They're, they're, they're built on the, on the ten plagues of Egypt. And, and when God came down to Egypt, he wasn't just mad at the Egyptians. What he was doing was delivering his people, bringing them out of Egyptian slavery and into freedom. And what I've discovered is that that's what God's doing with these seven last plagues. It's not that he's mad at the wicked. It's that the wicked refuse to let go of God's people. They're trouncing his people, the apple of his eye. And so what I've discovered is that the seven last plagues are actually God's plan to deliver us and bring us into eternal life. And so actually, rather than, than the last day events and the time of trouble and these seven last plagues being something to dread and fear, there's something to look forward to as God delivers us. As we draw near to Earth's final days, ominous times lay ahead of us, frightening times. But the clear message of Revelation is this. Those who trust in Jesus Christ need not fear. Did you hear that? Those who trust in Jesus Christ need not fear because if you trust him, he will see you through. That is the message that comes over and over and over again in this book. He will see you through. In Revelation chapters 15 through 18, we see what happens to those who reject God. We see what happens to those who reject His government, His leadership, His authority, His reign. In these chapters, we read of the pouring out of God's wrath upon those who worship the satanic trinity that we've studied about, of God's judgment on the prostitute, Babylon. As we read these chapters, do not forget the big picture, however. God triumphs over Satan. His people win. That's the big picture. Now let's read of God's wrath against those who reject him. We're going to begin with Revelation chapter 15, the first verse, and here God, John is uh, beginning with a portrayal of the preparation for the execution of God's final wrath upon those who rejected his call for repentance. Revelation chapter 15, starting with verse 1. Follow along as I read. It says here, I saw in heaven another great and marvelous sign, seven angels with the seven last plagues, last because with them God's wrath is completed. And I saw what looked like a sea of glass mixed with fire, and standing beside the sea, those who had been victorious over the beast in his image. And over the number of his name, they held harps given them by God. In verse 2, John sees the redeemed standing in heaven by the sea of glass. It's as though he's deciding, I want to give away the end of the story before we start. I want you to see the end picture before we begin. Because he's starting here to tell us about the pouring out of the seven last plagues. He says, but don't be frightened because before we get there, let me show you where you end up. You may go through this, you may see it happening all around you, but I want you to know where you end up. You're going to be on the sea of glass. You have no reason to fear because we know the end of the story. You're going to be in heaven. You trust God. He's going to get you through the plagues without being harmed. Those who are faithful to Jesus will stand triumphant. At the end of the day, they're going to be there in victory, worshiping their God, 
worshiping their Savior. Singing the song of Moses, the song of the Lamb. Notice that this song of victory, the song of Moses, the song of the Lamb, it focuses entirely upon God. Look at Revelation chapter 15, verses 3 and 4. It says, Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the ages. Who will not fear you, O Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. This song focuses entirely upon God. That's true worship. True worship focuses on Him. Whenever you become the focus, it's not true worship. Now, we may, in the passing of worship, talk about our experience in the light of the true God, but the focus of worship is always on God. He is the center. That is true worship, and that is what's taking place here in heaven. They're singing the song of Moses, the song of the Lamb. They're singing praise to our God. Those who are faithful to God will worship Him exclusively. They will worship Him well. They will praise Him for bringing them safely to heaven. By the way, those who are faithful to God will pay attention to their worship. They will, they will not present to God something that is haphazard. They will give Him their best. We will worship Him exclusively. We will worship Him well. Verse 6 tells us that seven angels hold on the seven last plagues are preparing to pour those plagues out on the earth. They are about to pour out God's wrath on the earth. The plagues are reserved for those who have rejected God and His kingdom and His authority and His rule. They are not for you. They are re a response to their choice and their refusal to repent. They have chosen to rebel. They refuse to repent. This is God's response. Verse 8 tells us that no one could enter the temple while the plagues are being poured out. Look at verse 8. It says, And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from His power. And no one could enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. Now the temple is a place of forgiveness. In the Old Testament, when you had a sin, you would carry some offering, a lamb or a dove or something to the temple. You were there, kill that animal. The blood would be shed. It was, it was a place of forgiveness for you. But no one can enter the temple during the pouring out of these plagues. Why? Because finally the door is closed. There comes a point when he says, everyone has made up your mind now. This is where we stand. And at the pouring out of these plagues, people have decided where they're going. There are those who have received the mark of the beast. But there are also those who have been sealed with the seal of God. That decision is set now in concrete, as it were. No forgiveness at this point. This is the first time that we will ever see God's wrath unmixed with mercy. Grace has always diluted His wrath in the past. That's primarily because His wrath had one particular purpose. It was to bring men and women to repentance. But if there's no forgiveness, there's no reason for repentance at this point. As we get close to the end of time, there comes a time when God says, now is is. Everyone's made their decision. This is where it ends. Those who are holy will be holy still. Those who are filthy will be filthy still. This is where it stops. So there's no need for repentance because there's no more forgiveness. Those who are going to receive it have already received it. That means that now his wrath has a different purpose. It's not to bring men and women to, to repentance. It is a punishment. It is an act of deliverance for those who trust him. That's why this is called God's strange act. We haven't seen wrath without mercy ever before. But here at the end of time, we will see it. Wrath and no mercy. It's strange because we've never seen God behave in this way. It's unlike what we've ever seen. However, there comes a time when God says enough is enough. Probation is closed. Everyone has had adequate time to make up their minds. Everyone has made their decision. God is merciful, but He will not be merciful forever. A day is coming when those who reject Him will receive their just desserts. Now you remember in Revelation 6, we had a picture of the martyrs who were under the altar and they were crying out to God, how long before you avenge our blood? How long? The seven last plagues answer that question. It's now. When those start pouring out, God is saying, now is the time. The decision has been made. The die has been cast. It is time now to execute judgment. Those who remain faithful to Him 
will not see these plagues, though. You're not going to be affected by them. You will see them around you, but you won't be affected by them. If you have decided to claim Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you stand in His grace, you will not be hurt by these things. They're not intended for you. The plagues are reserved for those who have rejected God's call to repentance and have persecuted His people. They are God's undiluted wrath against those who have ultimately rejected Him. So let's look at those plagues. We go now to chapter 16, starting with verse 1. But remember, these will not hurt you. These will not hurt you. Let's take a look at them. Verse 1, Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go pour out the seven bowls of God's wrath on the earth. The first angel went and poured out his bowl on the land, and ugly, painful sores broke out on the people who had the mark of the beast and worshipped the image. Those who have received the mark of the beast and have worshipped the satanic trinity will be marked with painful sores or boils perhaps. But if you have the seal of God, you won't have the boils. You won't have the wounds, the sores. Let's go to the next angel. It says, the second angel poured out his bowl, this is verse 3, on the sea, and it turned into blood like that of a dead man, and every living thing in the sea died. Verse 4, the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water, and they became blood. Then I heard the angel in charge of the water say, you are just in these judgments, you who are and who were the Holy One, because you have so judged. For they have shed the blood of your saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink as they deserve. Now these first three plagues remind us of the plagues that fell upon Egypt, do they not? When the Israelites were about to be set free, God came in and delivered them from Pharaoh's hand by pouring out these plagues. And we remember these. Were the Israelites touched by these plagues? The answer is no. Did they therefore have any reason to be afraid of them? Again, the answer, no. The plagues were given for their deliverance. Guess who God's delivering here? You. He's delivering spiritual Israel, all of those who have become a part of God's family by belief in Jesus Christ. We have the blood of Jesus cursing through our our veins. We, We have the blood of Jesus coursing through us. That means that we belong to him and we have nothing to fear from these plagues. Second and third plague turn the seas, the rivers, and springs of water into blood. They respond to the shedding of the blood of the martyrs. Babylon has shed. Look at verse 8. The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and the sun was given power to scorch people with fire. They were seared by the intense heat, and they cursed the name of God who had control over these plagues, but they refused to repent and glorify him. No one repents of the plagues. Remember? The temple is sealed. There's no one who can go in. There's no forgiveness now. Probation is closed. So they're not going to repent. It's just going to harden their hatred for God and for you, his people. It it appears obvious that the first four plagues are literal. They're going to happen. Now, the next three plagues may actually be taken more spiritually than literally. Now, whether they are actual literally, uh, they will actually literally happen or whether they are just spiritual, the, the truth is that their effects are spiritual. So let's take a look at them. And notice something else here before I read here. We're not taking a long time to explain each one of these plagues because they're not for you. Don't spend a long time trying to figure out what, what each one of them is about. It's not for you. You won't be hurt by this. Look at verse 10. The fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast. And his kingdom was plunged into darkness. Men gnawed their tongues in agony and cursed the God of heaven because of their plans, pardon me, of their pains and their sores, but they refused to repent of what they had done. Now, the fifth plague is different from the first four. The first four were pretty much universal. They cover the whole earth. But this one targets the throne of the beast. It is targeted. This is a supernatural thing that's happening here. And basically, this darkness that happens... It is so intense, so great, so dark, that they gnaw their tongues in agony. Verse 12, the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings of the east. Then I saw three evil spirits that looked like frogs. They came out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. They are spirits of demons performing miracles and signs. 
And they go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them for the battle on the great day of God Almighty. The sixth plague, the drying up of the river Euphrates, signifies the, the collapse of end time Babylon, the religious system that opposes God and his people. History tells us that ancient Babylon fell when the Medes and the Persians diverted the river. You remember that great city Babylon that had two sets of walls that were around it and the U river Euphrates flowed right through it and at night they would lower the gates with iron bars down to the river so no one could come in but the water could still flow through. But when King Belshazzar had his drunken feast, his guards got drunk, they forgot to lower the gates. And the Medes and the Persians dug a channel which diverted the river and then they walked through in the riverbed and took the city. The drying up or the diverting of that river caused Babylon to fall. Here, spiritual Babylon is described as falling when the river Euphrates dries up. That means that the people, the nations, the powers, the religious and political powers that have supported Babylon will withdraw their support. They'll see this to be empty. They'll draw their, withdraw their support and Babylon will fall. That's the drying up those river, the, uh, the water of the river Euphrates. The kings from the east, in verse 12, is a reference to Christ and his army of saints. Verse 13 speaks of evil spirits that look like frogs. Frogs symbolize something that is unclean in Scripture. Verse 14 makes it clear that there will be an increase of demonic activity as we draw close to the end of time. People, people laugh, they scoff at the idea of demons in the world, but folks, demons are real, they are here. They were real in Jesus' time. They're still around. You may not have seen them, but you hold on. You, if you're uh, alive as, as uh, the second coming approaches, you'll see it. It'll be around you. There will be an increase of demonic activity. Now, the seventh plague is about to be poured out. But first, Jesus has a word of encouragement for his people. We find it in verse 15 of chapter 16. Behold, I come like a thief. Blessed is he who stays awake and keeps his clothes with him so that he may not go naked and be shamefully exposed. Now what does that mean? Blessed are you if you're smart enough to keep your clothes with you. What clothes is he talking about? Hey, there's only one set of clothing that's gonna get you through this and that is the robe of Christ's righteousness. If you are clothed with that robe, if he gives you his righteousness, his perfection in place of your sins, then you are clothed. As long as you're wearing his robe, you've got nothing to fear. That robe will see you through. When you stand in the, the clothing of your own good works, you're naked. But when you're wearing the robe of Christ's righteousness, you are covered, you have nothing to fear, because that robe will see you through. Folks, you have nothing to fear from the plagues. You trust in Jesus, he will cover you, he will see you through, he will protect you, and at the end, you will sing the song of Moses and of the Lamb. He will protect you. Easy isn't what I'd call it. Who knows what easy means? The more I try to make this happen, the less it's clear to me. The hope that keeps me moving is in your promises to me. gonna have to be sometimes yes sometimes no sometimes that's the way it goes you're not giving any secrets away who's to know who's to say sometimes it's hard to live this way holding on letting go Sometimes yes, sometimes no. I want to know just what it looks like, what the answer's gonna be. I want to grab a hold of something to give me some security. Yes, 
It is amazing and comforting to realize that the seven last plagues are not meant for the people of God. Those who have been clothed with the robe of Christ's righteousness have nothing to fear for the future. And He stands holding that robe out to you today. He wants you to accept it. The only thing that remains is for us to basically receive that robe, to invite Jesus Christ into our hearts, to give our hearts and our lives, to confess our sins to Him, and to ask Jesus to clothe us with His robe. In so doing, we make sure that we have absolutely nothing to fear from the seven last plagues. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you again next time on Faith for Today. Down the one road lies all the world can offer, all its power, its wealth and fame. Down the other just a man with nail scars in his hands but there is healing in his eyes and there is power in his name I choose Jesus I choose Jesus without a solitary doubt I choose Jesus not for Cheese.